Hey guys, what's up? Mad Season here, back with another video for you. Throughout World of Warcraft's initial five-year development, there were many features that were either implemented and removed, or they just never got past the planning phase. We've done a couple of videos covering some of these unreleased secrets, and for episode three, we're going to explore the long-lost Alpha 0.5.3 client. This was the first publicly playable version of the game, and a little fun fact of the history is that this was the version that was leaked out during the internal alpha testing. A person by the name of Skull socially engineered either a tester or an employee of Blizzard themselves, and they leaked it to the internet where people began reverse engineering it and then making server software, which marked the birth of the private server community. Something that wouldn't be possible without mad coding skills like with what you can learn from Boot.dev. Boot.dev is a platform for anyone looking to master backend development, and unlike my voice, it's built to make sure that you never get bored by taking cues from game design to keep you engaged and pushing towards a career in backend development. You'll find courses here that teach you backend web development using Python and Go, right from the basics to the more advanced concepts. The lessons are designed such that you're not just passively learning, you're actually coding, which is the best way to learn. And their mission is to make learning to code as engaging as possible. One of the reasons why I'm working with them is that their platform makes you feel like you're playing an RPG, which I'm sure will resonate with a lot of you considering that you're most likely addicted to World of Warcraft. It has levels to complete and achievements to unlock. And because it's self-paced, you can learn at your own speed. And if you hit a snag, don't worry. They have an AI to help. And they don't just give you the answers, but rather asking guided questions to help you understand concepts. They offer a 30-day, no questions asked refund policy and a free demo for every course. So if it interests you, you can try it risk-free and see if it's the right fit for you. Click the link in the description and use my code to get 25% off your first payment, which is 25% off either your first month or your first year, depending on which plan you choose. Anyways, to start off here, interestingly enough, cut content can be found from official Blizzard literature. For those of you who have the original game manuals, if you flip to the classes page, you'll find a race class combination that never made it to vanilla, which is the Dwarven Mage. This was said to be cut not for lore reasons necessarily, but rather because the developers felt like the Alliance had more freedom with race and class combinations, so in classic Blizzard fashion, instead of increasing the combinations for Horde, they piss off everybody by removing this particular one for the Alliance. But this wouldn't be the only interesting thing in the manual. If you were to look at the races section, you would also find the original troll models. These have become rather infamous over the years for their ugliness, for lack of a better term. They were changed to be a little bit more appealing to the eye because all of the beautiful people were on the Alliance, not just in real life, but in game as well and this would be something that would be taken a step further in the Burning Crusade expansion when, controversially, the Blood Elves were added, which was a pretty big deal back then because they didn't really mesh with the aesthetic that the Horde had at the time. I can't believe that they gave us fucking Blood Elves. They're not evil. They're, you ever go to the fucking Blood Elf City Silvermoon? All these fucking pretty colors and shit. And this wasn't the only model change. A keen eye can notice very slight differences in posture and even animations with pretty much every race and sex in this alpha. Apparently Blizzard felt that they were a little too roughshod and they gave model and animation updates across the board sometime during the beta. Next we have an actual feature and that's the original talent system. In vanilla, as you know, all classes eventually landed on the talent tree system where each level you gain attributes and a talent point to spend in three different trees that drastically changed the gameplay of your character. Before that though, they were much more classic D&D RPG-like where attributes weren't automatically granted upon level but instead were chosen. Each level you would gain talent points and you could spend them on a variety of different things such as attributes, defensive talents such as dodge, regeneration, shield blocking, armor, magic resists, or offensive talents would be increased damage versus certain enemy types like beasts or humanoids, or interestingly enough, even the ability to track them, which was of course eventually given to hunters. You could specialize in different weapon types and increase their attack rating, like one-handed and two-handed maces, swords, axes, depending on your class. 
The system was eventually scrapped based on the premise that it offered the illusion of choice and everybody just picked the best talents, so it didn't really have any reason to exist. And this would be true to some extent with the reworked system, but on the flip side, there were a few different builds for each class that offered pretty varied playstyles, such as the subtlety PvP rogue versus combat PvE, or a tanky demonology warlock versus the glass cannon destruction, to name just a couple of examples. In vanilla, you probably know about weapon skills. You get a new weapon, train it, and flail wildly at enemies, missing 90% of your attacks because your weapon skill is too low. Well, originally, magic functioned similarly, where each time you used a spell, the appropriate magic school would increase in skill level. So, cast a fireball, gain skill in fire, you throw out a heal, gain skill in holy magic, and so on. In the release, the skill is still in the game, but it was changed to just level up automatically every time that the players level up. Next, going back to cut content, we have the Undermine. Early pre-release maps reveal that it was intended for vanilla in 2004. Undermine is a sprawling subterranean city nestled beneath the island of Kazan in the southern sea of Azeroth near the Maelstrom and it's basically the home of the goblins who remained neutral throughout the game until the Cataclysm where they joined the Filthy Horde. It's renowned for its elusive goblin trade princes who command private armies and expansive trade fleets and turning it into a frenetic center of commerce and intrigue. In previous episodes, we discussed these unreleased areas and items under the context of possible Classic Plus content. You can't really get closer to the spirit of vanilla than areas that were actually planned in vanilla. And although this never made it past this concept stage, it was seriously considered at one point and it could have some potential in this undefinable Classic Plus that people talk about. It could be maybe a raid tier or something. In a previous episode, we briefly mentioned Alpha Ironforge, and I figured it was big enough to warrant a full tour here. So the first thing you'll notice is that King Magni's statue is missing, and entering the city, that main square that held the bank and auction house is also gone completely. There are now two rings, an inner and an outer, with two floors across the outer ring, with the important buildings that you know, such as the military wing or the mystic wing and so on, being on the second floor, as for the Hall of Explorers, it looks pretty similar, with one exception being the flight path nearby. As for the inner ring, some other important areas can be found, such as the Forlorn Cavern, where rogues found their trainers. You can also find the bank here, complete with guards falling out of the sky, and also Old Iron Forge, as it's known, which we showed off in a previous episode since it was tucked away in the throne room in the new version. In this version, this was the actual throne room where King Magni resided brooding that they haven't finished his statue yet. The Deep Run Tram can also be found in this inner ring. You get there by way of an elevator, and it looks very different. You'll recognize the architecture from Nomragon, and... Uh, holy shit! Come and play with us, Daddy, forever and ever and ever. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's scary. The trams were never implemented before the remodel, but there are two different direction where it splits off to. It's theorized that this would take you not only to Stormwind, but also Darnassus. Obviously in the final version, we only got Stormwind, which if you're curious on the other side of things, what would eventually be the Deep Run Tram entrance is just a brick wall. So the reason why all of this was changed was that players kept getting lost which isn't surprising considering that the map wasn't even available in this version of the game. But anyways, for the next one, going back to Stormwind, you'll notice that one of the attractions in a previous episode, that scrapped housing district, is also missing. And that's because at this point, players were actually able to place houses themselves. So this was a very short-lived feature. But yes, Blizzard did at one point give players the ability to find a spot in Azeroth to plop down a house. This went through a few iterations actually. There was another landmass set aside, mainly for testing, that actually existed in the world. As placing them anywhere in Azeroth, you would run into obvious issues such as blocking off critical questing areas, to name just one. This eventually fell through because the real estate was just too scarce and they were already struggling fitting the Eastern Kingdoms and Kalimdor into their own instances. In fact, one of the reasons, besides time, 
that the Outland was pushed back into its own expansion was because they simply didn't have room for it. So after all of this, eventually, as said, they had plans to make their own housing instance in Stormwind, probably somewhere else in Orgrimmar for the Horde, but that didn't pan out and it would stay that way until Draenor, which had the infamous garrison system, which had its own host of issues that we'll save for another time. Don't worry, we'll do another episode about that expansion entirely at some point. And next, we have an oldie, but a goodie, and that's the survivalist profession. So this was a scrapped profession removed in the beta of the game, intended to aid players in traversing the world of Azeroth. As it turned out, the ability to make campfires was given to cooks, but this was originally a survival skill, along with the ability to light torches. You see, at some point, the dark areas in Azeroth were really dark, and they record the use of torches to be able to see where you were going, as well as giving you spirit. The way it worked was that you bought the torches from vendors, and then you lit them at campfires, and they would only last for a short amount of time. It's sort of like that crypt area in Dark Souls where you needed to use that skull lantern, for those of you who played that game. The campfires functioned pretty similarly, providing a spirit buff to those who sit near it, as well as allowing players to cook food, which made it for a good pair for cooking back when it was a primary profession. So this too has a lot of potential for Classic Plus. It's even been explored on private servers such as Turtle WoW. It would be a pretty interesting hardcore touch, I think, to have areas or maybe even dungeons and raids where they're pitch black and they require torches to navigate certain areas. Maybe a boss fight that requires torches in order to fight them. But yeah, anyways, that about wraps up this episode. Before signing off here, in case you missed it, I recently relaunched the Lil Mads plush, if you missed that from last year. The campaign is running for a couple more weeks for those of you who want to recruit this limited time DPS warrior to your party. He does not tank, just so you know. He never did the quest for the defensive stance, so don't even ask. But he does some pretty good damage. But yeah, anyways, uh, like the video if you liked it, because I'll see you in the next one. Peace. Farewell for now, mortals. We hope you enjoyed today's video. See you again soon.